All right. All right. No bathroom, no potty breaks. Lee, did you make a mess up here? I I don't want to pick on the Strawberry Twins anymore. They've had an, they've had enough problems. All right. I know is I want to hang out in my office as much as possible. Boy, I feel my office in there, man. It's nice. No, because once we got all you guys in there, it would change it. It's on right now, but yeah, I'll turn it off. That's all right. All right. Oh, I need a recorder up here, too. Unless I probably have them all with me. I do, don't I? Okay. Um, yeah, I need to get my cell phone back. My wife stole it from me. I have to get it back from her. Thank you. <laughs> they did? <laughs> All right.
That was hilarious when PJ got decked with that ice. I wasn't there, but I heard about it. And Brother Finney, being the attorney, goes, look at the evidence. It's right there. And people ask us, why do you have camera? Why do you have cameras with you? Oh, I don't know, because everybody always tells the truth, so we don't need them. Nobody ever lies about us, right? They never lie. What's that? Dog masks. Did you like? Did you like all those videos? <laughs> I got that right up in his face. <laughs> Nobody's gonna believe there's a sodomite dog face guy in front of us. Put it on there. Nobody will believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then people went crazy and tore up their own sign, their own team signs, right? Their pro sodomite signs, they tore them up. We're like, we don't care. Thanks. That helped us out. Was it? There was an old lady that went nuts. She was like 60 some years old, and she just went nuts. Yeah, she tried to tackle Jim. And she beat Jim down. She beat him down. Jim was a little scared. He's like, what's going on here? 60-year-old sodomite lady going nuts on you with full of devils? Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't a lady, that's for sure. <laughs> Crazy. Oh. Can't believe how mad some of them get. It's just just crazy. That's what I said to one. I said I thought I thought love wins. Yeah. Love is love. I know, that's why I kept saying pizza is pizza. Because pizza is pizza. Uh, yeah, I got them chanting pizza is pizza. That's how absolutely mindless they are. Pizza is pizza. <laughs> pizza is pizza. And then I had to teach them that if somebody didn't know what pizza was, you could not define pizza by saying pizza is pizza. We're talking about food. I'm done. Okay. All right. All right. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. We got to get moving here. Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to continue our series on Rome, identifying the great whore. And I thought that I would be done with this, <laughs> this message, but I won't be. Um, I added a bunch of things last night as I was doing some more studying and some reading that I think w helps to explain things a lot better. Um, so uh, we are adding those things in. I, I did add those things in. And then there's going to be another one. I might save that. I might do a Christology this afternoon because it'll be short. And those are shorter lessons. And, and then I'll save the third message in this great, the identifying the great whore. That third message will be saved for Wednesday, probably. So, and that's going to be the martyr, the blood of the martyrs found in her. And I want to deal specifically with the blood of the martyrs. And yeah, yeah, Islam, yeah, you know, because Islam has to be the great whore, right? Yeah, because uh, they've killed more people than anybody, right? Wrong. Or the Jews, yeah, Jerusalem did. Yeah, it's all. It's Israel, they did it all. They killed all more people than anybody. Wow, some people do not understand history very well. But anyway, so we're going to try to educate them and teach them. So that message will be on Wednesday, and I will deal specifically with the blood of the martyrs. And I'm going to give you a history of the blood of the martyrs as briefly as I can. I think it's like 15 pages, so I don't know. But it's, it's enough to give you. And I might add some things, some more Baptist things in there, just so people understand. I don't think you could, you know, every so often I think it's good to put that into your remembrance to remember who Rome is, remember what she did, and remember what she still does today. She just does it a little more covertly than she did before because she can't do it as openly. 
as before yet, but it's coming. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray you bless us now. Help us, dear God, to understand this great truth here today and understand being able to identify Rome as the great whore. A lot of confusion out there, Lord. We pray we would be able to explain that and teach that and show the difference in that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let me tell you this one, just to get started. If Rome is not trying to look like the great whore, she's doing a bad job of not trying to, okay? Because it's almost like she looked at the definition of the scriptures and said, that's who I am, and modeled herself completely after the great whore because she is the great whore. And it's prophecy, and it was prophesied that this is who she would be. And we have to understand that, and, and that's what the problem is. That everybody wants to try to make it something else. You've got Kent Hovind trying to make it Islam. Islam. So it's Islam. Islam doesn't have the power over the whole world. Are you kidding me? Come on, seriously. Really, you believe that? Yeah. And then you look at, and then you look at well, it's Jerusalem. Well, this is the time of the Gentiles. They have no king but Caesar. God said that they would not have that. They would they that they would if they sinned against him, they would be the servant. They would be the tail. They would not be the head. You know, so I mean there's just a lot that goes into that, but I don't know. Obviously they just don't understand. A lot of people don't understand. They would and you know what? Rome is a master at hiding themselves. They absolutely hide everything they do and blame it on somebody else. Well, let me just explain something to you. And this is for people that aren't very street smart, that are supposed to be street smart, but they're not very street smart. Because, I mean, I see a lot of truthers out there that I think they're dumber than a box of rocks, to be honest with you. They're supposed to have all this knowledge and understanding and, 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 the, and this truth or whatever like that, but they miss Rome, like, completely. Like, they miss it. And I'll tell you why. Because these things are spiritually discerned. And most of the truther movement is lost and on their way to hell. And they cannot discern that spirit. They cannot, they absolutely cannot. And this is where they mess up and they stop short. And they're like, yeah, it's the Rothschilds. They run everything. Oh, by the way, did you see that fake picture that goes around where the Pope is kissing the Rothschilds' finger? That's not even the Rothschilds. That's not who that is. That's a fake. In fact, uh, Andrew, what's that? Yeah, it's a memorial for the Holocaust. And, and actually, uh, Andrew Freeman, I think his name is, he pointed out and showed the references of how that's not even, that's not who that is. Somebody just made that up. Now, why would somebody make that up? Okay, let me try to teach you something, okay? Anytime somebody, le let me put it in this way. I'll put it in these terms. It'll help you understand it. If you're a high-level drug dealer, if you're high-level, all right, now, you know what I'm going to say here, probably. You probably understand what I'm going to say, David. You probably get it because you were in the, you know, the, the work that you did, the prison system, all that kind of stuff. If you're a high-level drug dealer, there's always an art. And what is the art? You never get your hands dirty. You don't get your hands dirty. You pay people to get their hands dirty. You pay people to take the risk, and you always look like the person doesn't do anything i mean i had people i, I never mind i'm not going to go into that but um <laughs> it's not a good idea but i'll just keep going but anyway let me just say that that the best criminals in the world are the ones that no one ever catches they never they have losers who do those things for them and they have fall guys set up to do those things for them. And the Jews are the, the, the high-level Jews that are in different portions of government, finances, and everything else are those stooges to do that work. Come on, folks. The guy, the Pope walks around in white wherever he goes. He's the most wicked, defiled, dirty, perverted, sick, disgusting, murdering pig you'll ever find. But he walks into every country with a white robe on. It's not that hard. It's easy. And that's what every high-level mobster does. 
They don't get their hands dirty. That's what Hillary does when she killed Vince Foster. Did Jezebel get her hands dirty? Mm -mm. Yeah, that's all that was left. See what I mean? So you have to understand that's the way it works. So when you stop short and you blame it all on the Jews and you stop short right there, that's just what they want you to do. Because that's the obvious trail. Now you have to look spiritually into the book. And you have to say, okay, now where does this, where does the truth go? Where do we go with this? Like what, what defines this? What defines, and what evidence do we have that Rome is the great whore? Now let's look at it. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, come up hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth. By the way, there's people that have a vested interest in Rome not being this. They have an absolute vested interest in Rome not being this great whore. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her, full, in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom. By the way, people always try to refute this. You know what they say? And there's an error in the King James Bible here at this point. They say, oh, there's an error here. With the ten kings of the kingdom. That's that's mistranslated. Well, why is that part mistranslated? Which have received no kingdom as of yet, as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That's how you find the spirit of Babylon. They have one mind. They're all together. It's like some guy told me the other day, or some guy was yelling at that sodomite event, he was yelling at it. God doesn't want us to work together. God doesn't want us to be one. He wants to tear down the wall. I was like, yeah, you want to put another brick in the wall, don't you? What was he? He was a one-worlder. That's what he was. He was an antichrist. New age. Right? Babylon shaking his fist at God. God doesn't want us to build the bridge up to heaven. God doesn't want us to build the gateway of the gods. He doesn't want us to have it. God's afraid of us. There you go. Same spirit. What is that? The spirit of Babylon. That's what it is. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. Hey, spirit of Babylon, always at war with the lamb. Always at war. We're going to talk about the spirit of Babylon today. This message is what we're going to concentrate on. The spirit of Babylon defined and Rome's temporal power. We're going to deal with those two things because they're very important to understand. There's that temporal and then that spiritual power. The temporal power is the fornication with the kings of the earth. The spiritual power is the spirit of Babylon. And that's how you find her. That's how you trace the whore. That's how you find where she is. 
These have one mind and shall give their power and strength. Okay, so they war against the lamb, right? And the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. They're just going to use her when they're done with her. They're done with her. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. It's all prophecy, folks. That's all it is. This is all prophecy being fulfilled. Rome is prophecy being fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So we're going to analyze that. We're going to look at that So uh, today, and I've got to keep moving here, but this is kind of long. But number one, the kings of the earth, the governments have fornicated. This is the temporal power, and we're going to concentrate on this here for a short time here. Revelation 17, 2 says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, ma- have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Which city in the world since the time of Revelation after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the city was destroyed has become the center of power and control? Which world leader believes he has both the temporal and spiritual power, the two keys? Rome, the Pope. Popes have long claimed dominion over the world and its peoples. Pope Gregory XI, his papal bull of 1372, claimed papal dominion over the entire Christian world secular and religious, and excommunicated all who failed to obey the popes and to pay them taxes. In Konea, it was confirmed by subsequent popes, and in 1568, Pope Pius V swore that it was to remain an eternal law, that they would have temporal power over the kings of the earth. Where else do you go where governments, where, where a man comes in and they bow the knee to him? They bow down and they kiss his hand. And they recognize his authority throughout all the world. And he speaks. Yeah, we're going to get to that. He speaks before Congress. Where? Where else? Pope Alexander VI in 1492 to 1503 claimed that all undiscovered lands belonged to the Roman pontiff. For him to dispose of as he pleased in the name of Christ. And his vicar, King John II of Portugal, was convinced that in his bull Romanus Pontifex, The Pope had granted all that Columbus discovered exclusively to him and his country. Ferdinand and and Isabel of Spain, however, thought the Pope had given the same lands to them. In May of 1493, the Spanish-born Alexander VI issued three bulls to settle the dispute. Why is a Pope settling disputes over land? In the name of Christ, who had no place on this earth, that he called his own this incredible evil Borgia, Borgia or Borgia? Borgia. Borgia, Pope, claiming to own the world, drew a north-south line down the global map of that day, giving everything on the east to Portugal and on the west to Spain. Thus, by papal grant, out of the plenitude of apostolic power, Africa went to Portugal and the Americas to Spain. When Portugal succeeded in reaching India and, and Malaya, they secured the confirmation of these discoveries from the papacy. There was a condition, of course, to the intent to bring the inhabitants to profess the Catholic faith. It was largely Central and South America, which as the consequence of this unholy alliance between church and state, had Roman Catholicism forced upon them by the sword and remain Catholic to this day. North America, with the exception of Quebec and Louisiana, was spared the dominance of Roman Catholicism because it was settled largely by Protestants. They've never rescinded their papal authority of temporal power. Never. Nor have the descendants of the Aztecs, Incas, and Mayas forgotten the Roman Catholic priest, backed by the secular sword, gave their ancestors the choice of conversion, which often meant slavery or death. They made such an outcry when John Paul II, in a a visit to Latin America, proposed elevating Junipero Serra, a major 18th century enforcer of Catholicism among the Indians, to sainthood, that the Pope was forced to hold the ceremony in secret. Why? Because the guy slaughtered their people. That's why. 
That's what Rome does by the sword. That's how you can find her whore little children, because she enforces it by the sword. That's how you find her. She enforces it by the sword. Whenever you see that spirit, that's the spirit of Babylon. That's what it is. Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight. The popes, however, have fought with armies, navies in the name of Christ to build a huge kingdom, which is very much of this world. And to amass their earthly empire, they have repeatedly engaged in spiritual fornication with emperors, kings, and princes. Claiming to be the bride of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church has been in bed with the godless rulers down through history. And these adulterous relationships continue to this day. This spiritual fornication, we're going to document here and you're going to show you. We're going to show you. See, in order to control people, you have to have a work salvation. So when you th threaten kings that they're going to be excommunicated and burn in hell, and then you frame them and set them up, like, for instance, a king commits adultery, then what the pope would do is the confessor, one of the confessors, a bishop, would find out that, and he would take that information as a spy network to the pope, and he would tell the pope, and he would say, listen, he committed fornication. He committed adultery. Well, don't forgive him. We need to, we need him. So then when they were when they needed something done and that that king wouldn't do it. Then they would threaten him with eternal damnation. So the king. Would kill people for the pope. He would send his armies. After people. That's what happened to the Waldensians. That's what happened to. Why? Because usually the pope had something on, or a cardinal, or a bishop had something on that king. And that king, because he didn't want to be excommunicated from the church, would do whatever that pope said. Even though he signed an edict, and he said that he wouldn't, he wouldn't persecute those people, he would go back on that because the kings of the earth had committed fornication with her. See how that works? It still works that, that same way today. Why do you think there's no congressmen that stand up against anything? Hey, I'll throw one out to you. Why do you think why do you think they fold when it comes to hardcore decisions that need to be made and to stand up and they fold? Well, if somebody walked up to you and handed you an envelope and said, "Look at it." And then you open up the open up and you see pornographic pictures of you committing fornication or some of those people like raping children or they just show you pictures of your wife and kids and they just say we'll kill them sorry to get real on you here today it is church though but that's what they do that's why nobody stands. Because they have so many skeletons in their closet. Most of them are so stinking dirty and wicked. In fact, most of them that, that join Skull and Bones and all those other groups, they have to do a perverted act, completely perverted and videotaped and recorded. So to get the power that they want, and then if they ever step out of line, it'll go full scale. It'll go open. That's why, why do you think they never step out of line? From her inception, Rome has committed spiritual whoredom with the pagan rulers and the demonic powers of this world. She gleefully joined hands with Constantine of old, and she has disobediently affiliated with pagan governments ever since. In Romans chapter 18, verse number 7, turn there, please. This talks about her actions. I, Revelation 18, did I say Romans? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, Revelation 18, yeah, sorry about that. Revelation 18, verse 7. Jacob thought I was trying to trick him. It's like, is this like Hezekiah? I'm not falling for that again. 
Revelation 18, 7. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. They have lived deliciously with her. They have gotten rich. They have gotten successful. They have gotten power. They have gotten money. They have gotten influence. They have gotten everything from her. Shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. She controls all governments. She's behind all governments and will help to form the end times beast or one world government religion. Nimrod did the same thing, right? He merged the religion with the state and ran the world. He built a tower, right? The gateway to the gods. We see that spirit of Babylon in Genesis chapter 11, which we'll not get to right now. We're going to go back to that. But in Genesis chapter 11, when we talk about the spirit of Babylon, we're going to get to that. And I'm going to show you that. And then in Daniel and a few other places. But you know what? Nebuchadnezzar, he, or, he, he merged the soothsayers, the sorcerers, the sheriffs, the governors, and all the rulers together, together and had them bow down and worship the image of the beast. Same spirit, spirit of Babylon. We'll talk about that. The Vatican has consistently fought every democratic advance from absolute monarchies toward government by the people, beginning with the Eng England's Magna Carta. In 1215, they fought the, obviously they fought the Magna Carta. The mother of European constitutions, it's called. That vital document was denounced immediately by Pope Innocent III in 1198 to 1216, who pronounced it null and void and excommunicated the English barons who obtained it. Why? Well, you can't have, you can't have liberty of conscience. No. You can't have that. That was the groundwork that was laid for that liberty of conscience, that liberty uh, that w a government would once have. It didn't happen until Rhode Island, but. You know, but that was the groundwork that was laid for it. Prior to the revolution led by, here's another one, in Benito Juarez in 1861, Roman Catholicism had dominated the lives of the Mexican people and controlled the government for 350 years. It was the state religion and no other was allowed. As one author has stated, after an exhaustive investigation of the records, the oppression by Spain and the oppression by the Church of Rome were so intermeshed as to be indistinguishable by the people. The Roman Catholic hierarchy supported the Spanish regime, regime and excommunicated through its New World Inquisition, anyone resisting the power of the state. The government in turn enforced the church laws and as the secular arm functioned as the disciplinarian and even as executioner for the church. Rome has always had armies. People say, well, yeah, but America's in charge of the world. No, we have a military industrial complex and an army and we do what the pope says. And if there's a government out there that tries to change their currency, tries to do something against what they're supposed to, like I said earlier, we drop some democracy on them. Oh, you want some freedom? Let me give you a little bit of freedom. Right? So we send armies and we're like, we're going to give you some democracy. That's what you need. Right? Yeah, now you can, now you can vote. How do you like that? Because you know... We weren't told that Trump and Hillary were going to be the candidates or anything this year, right? We don't. It's it's not the illusion of choice, right? Both of them aren't working for a new world order, right? I mean, come on. A few years ago, they had pictures together. You, they have pictures together. They're all they're, they, they, He supported Hillary's campaign. How dumb are we? Stop it. Stop being stupid. Right. You don't have any choice. They're both devils. Right. One was trained at Fordham University. What is Fordham? Jesuit, Jesuit College. Yeah. Come on. But he's different. He's not part of the elite. There's no billionaire alive that's not part of the elite. Yeah. You can't be a billionaire right, right. and not be part of the elite. Are you kidding me? What are you smoking anyway to think that? No, Donald Trump stands on the outside and he's a maverick. <laughs> he's a maverick. You got Alex Jones. You got Alex Jones being like, yeah, we're pro Donald Trump. And everything is pro Donald Trump trying to get Donald Trump's going to save America. He's going to make America great again. And the elite hate him. 
Alex, he is the elite. What are you talking about? How could they hate him? Who hates him? No, come on. The elite hate him. Donald's different. He's a fascist. He's a right-wing nut job fascist. Part of the Pope's white power structure, right? Eh? Pushing the war with the Muslims. It's not hard. Connect the dots. It's real easy. But we need to be an educated people and understand these things. We need to understand that, this, listen, what I'm telling you about Donald Trump, this is all Revelation 17. That, that's all this is. This is the woman that rides the beast. She is in control now. She is running the world now. The government in turn enforced church laws and as a secular arm functioned as a disciplinarian, even an executioner for the church. That's what the Spanish government did. What do you think the Inquisition was about? You've got to have soldiers to pull out the Inquisition, right? People are very naive of the Jesuits, very naive. You find Jesuits everywhere on the battlefield, in the science lab, in all the major universities. In Baptist colleges, in Baptist churches, on Bible translation committees. Yeah. Her illicit relationship with civil government identifies her with Rome. That's who the great whore is. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Apostasy does not hesitate to unite with godless men in government to accomplish its purposes. The Roman Catholic Church during the Dark Ages yoked with secular government and oftentimes even ruled over it. The Roman Catholic Church still yokes with secular government. It has hundreds of ambassadors to the nations. The Protestant state churches in Europe have yoked with the government. The World Council of Churches works closely with the secular governments and international bodies such as the United Nations. The apostles and early Christians did not unite in any way with the Roman government but remained entirely separate and faithfully carried out the commission of Christ had given them. Apostate Christians care nothing for Christ's great commission, but have humanistic, socialistic, worldly goals. Therefore, they have no reason not to unite with the secular governments in these, go in these, in these goals that they have. She with Constantine, Rome with Constantine, relished and lived deliciously, those bishops did, through incorporation of churches and borrowed paganism. Wait, listen. This 501c3, this incorporation of churches, these big, huge buildings, these big, huge, um, those were all Constantine's inventions. That's where it came from. That's where incorporation really came from. That's where it po was popularized. It's mainstream and getting rich, and that's what these churches are, and that's the model of it. That was the model of incorporation. That is the model of church incorporation, that is, came from Constantine. That's where it comes from. Ancient. You can have a different modern one if you want, but it's all the same spirit. Right. It's yoking with, the, it's the beast yoking, right? It's, it's, it's the, uh, the whore yoking with the beast, riding the beast. Consider, for example, the arrogant imperialism of Pope Alexander III in 1159, declaring that the power of the popes is superior to that of princes. Alexander excommunicated Frederick I, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Germany and Italy, attempting to chastise the pope. Frederick's forces were defeated by the Pope's army. Wait a minute. What's a Pope doing with an army? Christ did, Christ said his army, he, was not, he said, if we was of this world, we would fight. Why does he have an army? Right. Because he's Antichrist. The, the chastened emperor came to Venice to beg forgiveness and absolution, promising to submit always to the Roman church. Imagine a church ruling the world by military might. The Catholic historian almost enthusiastically described the scene. He said this, when the emperor arrived in the presence of the pope, he laid aside his imperial mantle, knelt on both knees, and his breast on the earth. This makes me sick. This makes me want to punch the pope in the face. That's what it makes me Because if I was standing there and you said I had to bow to you, I'd punch you in the stinking face is what I'd do. I would not bow to you. You may think that's too aggressive, but that's okay. You can think what you want to. I'd still punch him in the face, though. Like, I ain't going to bow to you. I'll punch you right in your nose, you wicked devil. He's wicked. He's a wicked, murdering hey. devil is what he is. Bow to you. I'm going to bow to you. I'll spit on you, you stinking worthless. 
When the emperor arrived in the presence of the pope, he laid aside his imperial mantle and knelt on both knees and with his breast on the earth. Alexander advanced and placed his foot on his neck. This makes me sick. While the cardinals thundered forth in loud tones, Thou shalt tread upon the cockatrice and crush the lion and the dragon. The next day, Frederick Bar Bar Barbarossa kissed the feet of Alexander and on foot led his horse by the bridle as he returned from solemn mass to the pontifical palace. The papacy had now risen to a height of grandeur and power, which it had never reached before. The sword of Peter had conquered the sword of Caesar. Interesting, isn't it? That was recorded in A Woman Rides the Beast, the Roman Catholic Church, The Last Days by David Hunt. Historian Walter James writes this, the papacy controlled the gateway to heaven, which all the faithful, including their rulers, hoped earnestly to enter. Few in those days doubted the truth of this, and it gave the popes a moral authority, which has never been wielded since. Yielded, excuse me, not, not wielded. With the Pope's blessing, William the Conqueror killed Harold in battle, took England, and was crowned in London on Christmas Day, 1066. William accepted the crown in the name of the Holy See of Rome. You see the history? I'm trying to show you a history of them controlling governments, and nothing's changed. Another triumph for the papacy and greatly increased Roman Catholic influence in England. Freeman in the Norman Conquest elaborates on the arrangement. William was authorized by the Pope to go forth as an avenger of heaven. He was required to teach the English people due obedience to Christ's vicar. And what the papacy never forgets, to secure a more punctual payment of the temporal dues of his apostle. It's about money. Riches. That's the temporal and spiritual power combined, that Babylonian spirit, the mother of all harlots. She sits as a queen, right? She says, I'm a queen, and I'm no widow, and shall see no sorrow. The kings of the earth are the governments of the earth that have accepted Antichrist Rome and followed her. By the way, Rome has the seat on the UN, right? Rome is the only religious state, the only religious state. She has the merging of church and state. The church runs the state of the Vatican. We see the presidents of the U.S. bowing down and kissing the hand of the Pope. Why? Because the kings of the earth, all of them, bow to the Pope. He walks through every nation unmolested, never in danger, and always protected. When the, when the height of all of the, uh, when Benedict was, was in office and the height of all of the sexual molestation cases of children were at, Obama made a special press conference and said, we just need to get one thing straight. The Pope has absolute immunity. He cannot be arrested. But Obama's a Muslim, right? Yeah. Why does he have absolute immunity? He's the head of a state, and he cannot be arrested. He said it. What was he saying? He's saying, he's my boss. I work for him, and he can't be arrested. Yeah, and Saddam was the head of a state. Yeah, but I mean, you can't be like Russia and go invade countries and stuff. We've got to stop them. Russia can't just go ahead and invade countries. What do they think they are stepping over sovereign countries and doing what they want? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they learned it from watching you. Maybe that's too deep for some people, but you'll get it in a second. They reigned over the, He reigns over the kings of the earth. Finally, the angel reveals to John that the woman is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Is there such a city? Yes, and again, only one, Vatican City. Popes crowned and de de deposed kings and emperors, exacting obedience by threatening them with excommunication. At the time of the First Vatican Council in 1869, Professor Dullinger of Church History in Munich warned that Pope Pius IX would force the council to make an infallible dogma out of that pet theory of the popes that they could force kings and magistrates by excommunication and its consequences to carry out their sentences of confiscation, imprisonment, and death. He reminded his fellow Roman Catholics of some of the evil consequences of papal political authority. When, for instance, Pope Martin IV placed King Pedro of Aragon under excommunication and interdict, 
then promised indulgences for all their sins to those who fought with him and tyrant Charles I of Naples against Pedro and finally declared his kingdom forfeit, which cost the two kings of France and Aragon their life and the French the loss of an army. Why? Because he ran the world. Pope Clement IV in 1265, after selling millions of South Italians, listen, to Charles of Anwa for a yearly tribute of 800 ounces of gold, declared that he would be excommunicated if the first payment was deferred beyond the appointed term, and that for the second neglect, the whole nation would incur interdict. Though John Paul II lacks the power to enforce such brutal claims, his church still retains the dogmas which authorize him to do so. So any of the modern-day uh, popes today, they still claim the dogma. They haven't changed anything. They just don't enforce it openly. And the practical effects of the, of the power of the pope are no less than those of his predecessors. Though exercised quietly behind the scenes, the Vatican is the only city which, which exchanges ambassadors with nations, and she does so with every major country on earth. Ambassadors come to the Vatican from every major country, including the United States, not out of mere courtesy, but because the Pope is the most powerful ruler on earth today. Reagan is the one that signed off on that. He, he signed off on that. Uh, we didn't have relations with the Vatican for years. Since, uh, was it Lincoln or was it, I don't know. One of the, they, they, I think it was Lincoln. But uh, we didn't have those, those relations, but Lincoln reinstated, the, I mean, uh, Reagan reinstated those. The Gipper. Why? Yeah, he loved the King James Bible. Him and John Wayne. <laughs> Telling you. The John Wayne Masonic version, it's hot, man. The King James Bible. Pick that one up. Even President Clinton journeyed to Denver in August of 1993 to greet the Pope. He addressed him as Holy Father and Your Holiness. Right? Just like George W. That's right. Yes, ambassadors of nations come to Washington, D.C., to Paris, or to London, but only because the national government has its capital there. Nor does Washington, Paris, London, or any other city send ambassadors to other countries. Only Vatican City does so. Unlike any other city on earth, the Vatican is acknowledged as a sovereign state in its own right, separate and distinct from the nation of Italy surrounding it. There is no other city in church, I, no other city in history of which this has been true, and such is still the case today. Only of the Vatican could it be said that the city reigns over the kings of the earth. The phrase, the worldwide influence of Washington, means the influence not of that city, but of the United States, which has its capital there. When one speaks, however, the influence of the Vatican around the world, that is exactly what is meant. The city and the worldwide power of Roman Catholicism and its leader, the Pope. Vatican City is absolutely unique. The Vatican has been fulfilling John's vision from its location, Rome, from the past 15 years, or 15 centuries, excuse me. Moreover, we have shown the connection to ancient Babylon, which the Vatican has contained, I'm going to get to that, down through the history and the paganized Christianity it has promulgated. As for the ancient Babylon itself, it was even in existence during the past 2,300 years to reign over the kings of the earth. Babylon lay in ruins while pagan Rome and later Catholic Rome, the new Babylon, was indeed reigning over kings. One 18th century historian counted 95 popes who claimed to have divine power to, to depose kings and emperors. Pope Innocent III in 1198 held all Europe in his net. He thundered that the pope was lord and master of everyone and everything. Historian R.W. Southern declared this, during the whole medieval period, there was in Rome a single spiritual and temporal authority, the papacy, exercising powers which in the end exceed those that had ever lain within the grasp of a Roman emperor. That the popes reigned over the kings is an indisputable fact of history that we will more will, will fully document here in a minute. That in so doing, horrible abominations were committed, as John foresaw is also indisputable. Pope Nicholas I in 858 declared, we popes alone have the power to bind and to loose, to absolve Nero and to condemn him, and Christians cannot, under penalty of excommunication, execute other judgments than ours, which alone is infallible. In commanding one king to destroy another, Nicholas wrote this, we order you in the name of religion to invade his states, burn his cities, and massacre his people. Think they believe it? Sure he does. 
The qualifying information which John gives us, us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for identifying this woman who is a city is specific, conclusive, and irrefutable. There is no city upon earth past, present, past or present which meets all of these criteria except Catholic Rome and now Vatican City. That inescapable conclusion will come increasingly clear with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. All the leaders of the world, and especially America, the military-industrial complex for Rome, all bow the knee to the Pope. When the Pope visited Congress, he was given an audience to speak. Why? Because the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The most powerful nation in the world that was a Baptist, Protestant, principle-founded nation is having the Pope come in and lecture them. Here's a guy that lectures them people about taking care of the poor when he's worth trillions of dollars. <laughs> trillions of dollars. Right? Has golden thrones. But lectures us on how bad capitalism is. Well, why are you using capitalism then? I mean, you own all, you own billions of dollars, billions of stocks in all major corporations in the world. Why why do you why do you do that? That's capitalism. Right? See how see how Jesuits work? Right, you shouldn't have guns either. But he's protected by men that have guns. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, they own own stock in Beretta. I heard and everything else. Yeah, one of the largest stockholders. See, they make money off of everything. It's hypocrisy. Next, number two, and this is where, where we'll we'll finish with this this portion here. We have the spirit of Babylon, mystery Babylon, Revelation seventeen five, and upon her forehead was a name written, mystery, Babylon the Great. By the way, I didn't talk about this. Let me just back up here for a second on the kings of the earth. I didn't cover this because there's not time, but. The Jesuits and the Knight of through the through the Jesuits, the Knight of Malta, the Gregorian Order, and all these others, they control every major government office and every major government in the world. Okay, so I, I can't get into that now because there's just not time. I mean, you can go on and on with that. That's got to be a separate thing. We'll probably do that on Sound the Battle Cry or something sometime. But the Knight, the Knights of Malta, these are knighted men, knighted by the Pope, just like, just like. Um, the Supreme Court, all right, Justice, John, what's his, what's his name? Roberts. John Roberts, the Chief Justice, as soon as he put the stamp of approval and approved Obamacare and rejected the arguments of the American people against Obamacare, as soon as he did that, he flew off to Malta and he was knighted. As soon as he did that, he was taken on a private plane and vacationed in Malta. He got out of Dodge as quick as he could. What did he go over there for? To get his reward from his handlers for doing what he was told to do, to push socialism in America, the height of, and have government control of people's health. Now, why would that be important to the Pope? Because, Revelation 13, the beast control. So he was knighted. Others, uh, the head of all, the, uh, all of the uh, different exchanges, the commissions, all Knights of Malta. All of them knighted by the Pope or the Gregorian Order. Uh, the head of all um, media, Knights of Malta, head those. Though They are all specific, specifically knighted. Uh, I believe Ted Cruz. I think it's Ted Cruz. I can't remember, but I believe he is a Knight of Malta also, but I'm not sure. No, 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 not, no. Rick, um, Rick Santorum. Rick Santorum, a Knight of Malta. Sorry, not Ted Cruz. Rick Santorum. Knight of Malta. His wife, I think, is a dame of Malta, too. But um, the Queen of England is a dame of Malta. Okay, wait a minute now. So why, you tell me something. If the kings of the earth have not committed fornication with her, why in the world would the queen, who's supposed to have hated, and the Church of England was a protest against Roman Catholicism, why would she be a dame of Malta? Does that mean that well, would you let somebody knight you or, or, you know, a dame of Malta? Would you let somebody do that if you 
claim that you had superiority over them, why would you let them do that to you? If you were separated, so she's a daemon. Yeah, and she does what the Pope tells her to do. She's the queen. Yeah, I know. But they hold the power over the kings of the earth. They've already said that. See? See how it works? <laughs> it, I mean, there's more that could be said. There's more positions that, the, that in the government that are Knight of Malta. I mean, they're all over the place that are, that are in the Gregorian order, that are in all these other orders, okay? Uh, Rupert Murdoch is in one of the orders. I can't remember which one. He owns Fox News. But Fox is conservative, and they stand for truth. What's that? Gregory? Is that what it is? Yep. Anyway, so all these orders, through their orders, they run the, the governments of the earth. Through the Jesuits, and there's Jesuits all through Fordham University. Is that the one in Washington? Which one's is that? Which, Georgetown. Thank you. Georgetown. Georgetown University? Controlled. That's how they control. Wherever they are, that's how they control. Uh, Tim, is it Dalton? Timothy Dalton? Um, Cardinal Dalton, is that his name? In the bit uh, in uh, New York, it was who is it now? It's not Dalton. I thought it was. Who is it? Or did he die? One of them died. Egan died. Okay, yeah. So anyway, the the bishop there or the, the the cardinal there controls everything in New York City. The exchanges, everything, the financial exchanges, the the markets, everything. That's how they control everything. I thought it was Dalton. Dolan. 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 Thank you, Dolan. That's how they control. Wherever they are, that's what they control. Whatever they're in, they control. All right. Next, moving on to the spirit of Babylon. Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Notice anything interesting about that title? Count the words. How many words are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Uh oh. What's that? Rebellion. Rebellion. But that doesn't mean that according to some of these guys oh, that number stuff doesn't mean anything. Whatever you say. Thirteen stands for rebellion. The spirit of Babylon is the church, the state spirit. That's what this is. That spirit of Babylon is the state church, the mixing and merging the woman that rides the beast, the beast and the woman together, the false religion, the, 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 the religious state controlling it. That's what it's about. Turn to Genesis chapter 10. What's that? Right. It's a woman. That's right. That's right. It's a false religion. The spirit of Babylon. We find that way back, a one-world religion, a one-world government. Genesis chapter 10, verse number 8, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Go back and listen to that series I did on Nimrod a long time ago. It's a long time. But um, I covered a bunch of that. Nimrod's wife, everything else like that, Samarimus and all those things. Um, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was... Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And the whole earth was of one language. Genesis 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Do you ever get the, uh, the feeling that that's what's trying to happen again? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they brag about America as like one melting pot. Yeah. We're all just a melting pot. We're, we're all just the same. We're all one. Yeah. One love. I think you yeah. Right. That one word, and that's what it is, to erase every bit of distinction that you have, every bit of nationality you have, every bit of, of whatever your race is, to erase everything. Right. That's what it's about, bringing them all together into one. Why? You need that. You have to have that unity. That is part of the unity that is pushed by Babylon. That is the mystery. That is Why do you think she wants to merge all the little whore children back to mama? Why do you think she can sit and stomach being around Buddha and being around that fat Buddha statue and sit there and, and, and he's okay with that? And you can put Buddha up there instead of a cross up there and we can do, we can do the Eucharist yep. to Buddha. Yep. Why? One world. 
It's the spirit of Babylon. That's what the spirit of Babylon is about, to merge everybody one, one language, one nation. We're all just the human race, one nationality, one gender, right? One gender, it doesn't matter. I never spent so much time walking around. People walk up to me and I go, I'm sorry, but I don't know what you are. You're just being mean. Really? Because I don't know what they were. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't know what they were. I just told them, I don't know what you are. And it made me thank God. I'm like, man, I'm glad I go home and I'm married to a lady. I know she's a lady. And I do feel sorry for some of you young guys because, man, I'm telling you what, it's scary out there. (laughs) Good thing you're not going to find a wife out there. You've got to find it in here. Amen. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm telling you, it's scary. I'm telling you, you couldn't tell. There was more than one, bro. There was like hundreds of them there. People coming up in dog masks and furry outfits. And I thought they were Furbies. I was like, what are those? Fur-? Somebody said Furbies. Furbies? What's a Furby doing here? I don't know what that is. I mean, they were just. <laughs> I didn't know what they were. <laughs> Some dude came up in a dog mask and was like, can I have a serious conversation with you? I'm like. <laughs> to Nate, and I'm like, no, you got a dog mask on. What are you talking about? Can I have a serious conversation with you? What's the matter with you? Fido? So I had to put the FaceTime camera up and be like, here you go. You're not going to believe this. i got to show you what we deal with. I was raised in a Christian home. Rough, rough. (laughs) Thanks, Sparky. Can I get you a bone? Would you like a dog treat? I don't know what to give you. A dog treat? A cup of water? I don't know what to give you. (laughs) Literally, women walking around that cut their chest off, had their chest cut off, and they have no shirt on, and they they took hormones, and and their hairy chest and everything just walking around. And they have the scar all the way underneath them when they cut everything off. And they're built like men. Yeah. What is that? Spirit of Babylon. That's the androgynous spirit. That's Baphomet. That's that spirit. That's the spirit of Babylon. That's what's going on. That's why we have to erase all distinctions. We cannot have any distinctions. You cannot disagree with me or you hate me. Listen, that is Babylon. It's what it is, and it's what's being pushed today. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they, made, they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Nimrod. History says that he wanted to avenge his ancestors. And he would build a tower that would hold against the flood, that no flood, that God could not drown this. Kind of like the Titanic. And they said not even God could sink this ship. Then the Jesuits did, who thanked their God. So go figure. And the Jesuit jumps off. (laughs) He got a message sent to him, get off the boat. Get off the boat. Oh, come on now. You you just can't believe that that stuff actually happens. I know, it doesn't. Just, we're just making it up. Didn't happen in the Bible either right here. And they said, go to, let us build a city. So they built the city, right? And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. Now, wait a minute now. All right, now, could you think about this for one second? This isn't hard. What was God condemning here? Yeah, their humanistic, satanic unity. That's why I can't, like, I don't agree with these libertarians. They're like, nations don't, we don't need borders. Anybody can do what they want. They can cross over. We're libertarians. We believe in liberty for all, so we don't need any borders. No, you want anarchy, and that is antichrist. 
that it's just going straight overboard from liberty and understanding things and not tyranny and going straight the opposite direction into absolute anarchy where the Antichrist rod of chaos comes order. That's right. They know they don't care about the biblical doctrine of government. They want to be a libertarian over a Christian. That's what the problem is. And I'm going to make some, I'm going to make some people mad with that. They listen to that. Some of my friends, I love you, but you're wrong. You're dead wrong. You better get some biblical balance. God said, in this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. See, God had a problem with their imaginations before, didn't he? When? Well, Genesis chapter 9, he had a problem with their imaginations. He said that their imaginations were evil only in their heart continually. Everything was evil, and they'd imagine evil things, and they plotted evil things. And they Why? Because they're all working together. So I'm going to drown them all. They were all evil, so God killed them all. And then they decide, Then what happened? That same spirit came up again, right? Nimrod in Babylon, a man said, I want to rule the world, baby. And what did he do? He had the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Babylon, merge the state together with religion, Satan, Satanism, Luciferianism, the pure doctrine of Luciferianism, right? That's what he did. And that's what Nimrod did. And what goes along with that? War. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. What was that? A hunter of men's heads. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Now notice, I want you to notice something, and they left off to build the city. It's not over. They're still building it. That's right. They're still building it. Their spiritual kingdom and their, and their temporal kingdom to build an antichrist, one world government against God. Genesis eleven nine. 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel. From thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Then we turn to Nebuchadnezzar who rebuilt Babylon. Right where the Tower of Babel was. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1. Turn there. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, and the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image. What is he mixing here? The church with the state. Religion with the state. The woman riding the beast. That's the One World Trade Center, right, right there. Yeah, with the phallic symbol. That's right. One world. That's what they want. That's the goal. So he wanted them all to bow down to the image. Then a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. That at the time you hear this sound. By the way, that's what's going to happen. This same thing has happened in July 16th. Together, 2016. Right? Same thing. Yeah, praise the loud. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah. Then a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Look at that. Peoples, nations, languages. You all worship the same God. You all do the same thing. You all have a humanistic Luciferian unity. All antichrist and all against God. The only difference with Rome, which we're going to get to, is that she used the name of Jesus to do it. Which makes it more deceptive. Which the Bible says in the end times the deception would be high. That's why. Because there would be many antichrists that would go out in the world. That's right. Then a herald cried aloud to you is given. So uh, when they heard the music, when they hit the music, hit your knees and bow down. And whoso falls not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So what happened? Religious control through the state. 
Then we see in Revelation 13 the control and merging of the state and church, which we're not going to read that, but you understand that. I've read that many times. I've taught on that many times, so I'm not going to go through that. Babylon is identified with her idolatry, and Rome adopted many idolatrous practices, such as the worship of the Queen of Heaven. That's the spirit of Babylon. And the mystery mass, wherein God is sacrificed on man's altars. Evidence from Roman herself. Now I want to read you some of the evidence here about the spirit of Babylon, how the rites of Babylon are found in the Roman Catholic Church. That's how you know they have the same spirit. They have the same worship. Don't pay attention to the names they use as much as what they're doing. Okay? Here's why. Because Jesus said they would there'd be other they would preach other Christ. False Christ shall arise. What does that mean? They're going to call him Christ, but it's not the real one. That's not hard to understand. It's pretty easy, right? The apocalyptic emblem of the harlot woman with the cup in her hand was embodied in the symbols of idolatry derived from ancient Babylon. It is singular that in our own day, the Roman church has actually taken this very symbol as her own chosen emblem. In 1825, on the occasion of the Jubilee, Pope Leo XII struck a medal bearing on the one side his own image and on the other that of the Church of Rome symbolized as a woman holding in her left hand a cross and in her right a cup with the legend around her, the whole world in her seat. In her, yeah. I mean, she's not trying to look like the whore of Babylon. She's sure doing a bad job. Reproduced, there is a cut of that medal taken fr from a medal taken from the book Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, published in America by the Losaics Brothers in England. Uh, the book proves clearly and conclusively that the connection between the ancient Babylonian mystery religions and the Church of Rome. Here it is. Here's the spirit of Babylon in Rome. That's how we know she's a great whore. In addition, the notion that John's audience, which is here's what people under say. Here's one of the, the proof tech or the proof points here. Here it is. People say, well, nobody knew that. Rome was the city on seven hills, and they wouldn't have understood the idolatrous harlot and everything back then in John's time. He wouldn't have been able to liken Babylon to that, and they, they wouldn't have understood any of that. So that's just, it's just a lie. No, no, okay, listen. You listen to what's been found, okay? This, this, is, this proves extra, extra biblical evidence. We already proved it from the scriptures. Now check this out. Okay. In addition, the notion that John's audience would have understood the imagery of Revelation chapter 17, verse number 1, is referring to the topography of Rome, seems strengthened by the discovery of the Dea Roma coin, minted in AD 71 in Asia Minor. One side of the coin contains the portrait of the emperor. The reverse side of the coin depicts Rome, a Roman pagan goddess, sitting on seven hills, seated by the waters of the Tiber River. There are obvious similarities between the Dea Roma coin and the imagery of Revelation chapter 17 verse number one in both cases the goddess and the harlot are seated on the seven hills and are seated either on or by the waters so they found the coin that shows it from AD 71 right in addition the name of the goddess was thought by many Romans to be Amor which is Roma spelled backwards. Amor was the goddess of love and sexuality. Thus, both the women, woman on the coin and the woman in Revelation represent harlotry. Furthermore, furthermore, the coin equates Roma with the power of the Roman Empire, which was active in persecuting Christians of John's day. The placement of the Ve Vespasian on one side of the coin and Roma on the other makes this connection. The goddess is also pictured as holding a sword, which may depict Rome's imperial power. This imagery parallels with the woman in Revelation 17 who is said to be drunk with the blood of the saints. They, are, they knew that. John, they, they all knew that there. The next way you can find her is her man-made unity. The keynote of end times Babylon is ecumenism, the ecumenical movement. That's how you know she's the great whore. That's the identifier. They will drop down every doctrinal distinction to merge everyone together into one religion. Right. right? No, the Muslims aren't doing that, but the Pope's doing it. Neither the Jews, but the Pope's doing it. Babylon erects impressive structures and creates great systems of religion. 
Rebellion against God's revealed will is another sign. In Genesis chapter 11, verse number 4, we've seen that. God had told Noah's family to multiply and replenish the earth. Babel was a scheme to avoid being scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. End time Babylon is an open rebellion against New Testament scriptures and has replaced the word of God with human tradition. Pride, let us make us a name. End time Babylon is also proud and haughty with its impressive cathedrals and pomp and circumstance. It boasts of apostolic succession, its worldly ways. The association with Babylon of old identifies her with Rome. Mystery Babylon the Great, this connects the final apostate harlot, harlot church with the false religion established at Babel in the early history of man. In other words, it is the final product of Satan's corruption of true faith through the ages. Babel of old typifies the end time Babylon in the following ways. The Bible teaches that the beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod was at Babel, or in other words, Babylon. The wickedness of Babylon is evidenced by the story of the Tower of Babel, which is related in Genesis chapter 11. The people of Babel determined that they would build a huge tower in that city in direct defiance to God. They were in defiance toward God because they did not want to be scattered across the face of the earth. In order to avoid this, they wanted to build that tower. And God confounded their languages, obviously. Following the death of Nimrod, this is a little bit of history so you understand this, how it ties in with Rome today. Following the death of Nimrod, his heathen form of worship was continued by his wife, Queen Semiramis. She claimed that her husband had become the sun god and was to be worshipped. Sometime after this, Queen Semiramis conceived through adultery and gave birth to an illegitimate son who she named Tammuz. It is interesting to note here that Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 14 records the incident of women weeping in lamentation for Tammuz. The prophet is told that he will someday see greater abominations than this one, which indicates that even sorrow for Tammuz was wicked and idolatry. Upon the birth of Tammuz, Semiramis declared that he was actually Nimrod reborn. In addition to this, she also claimed that her son was supernaturally conceived. Now Semiramis undoubtedly knew of God's promise of a redeemer. Satan used her knowledge of this to induce her to set up a counterfeit plan of God's redemption. By having her claim that Tammuz was to be the savior of the world, however, even through Samarimus, even though she claimed that to have given birth to a savior, it was she that was worshipped and not the son. She was worshipped as, as the mother of gods. So from this point on, the principal role of the woman as opposed to the son is seen. Many different ideas from the Babylonian religion have come down through the generations. Probably the key doctrine that identifies her with the spirit of Babylon is the mother-son relationship. As the Babylonian people were scattered throughout the world, they took with them the idea that Semiramis had miraculously conceived and given birth to Nimrod reincarnated. Thus, all through the world, men began to worship a divine mother and godchild long before the birth of Christ. The woman appeared in different ways and is called by different names, but she is always the same person. The Chinese called her Xingmu. The Germans worshipped Hertha. The Scandinavians worshipped Sisa. In India, she was known as Indrenia. But the woman was really Semiramis, the queen of Babylon. Even Israel, when it fell into apostasy, worshipped Ashtaroth, who was known to the Jews as the queen of heaven, as told in Jeremiah 44. The spread of this doctrine was great at the time of Christ. The worship of the great mother was very popular under the Roman Empire. Inscriptions prove that the two, the mother and the child, received divine honors not only in Italy and especially in Rome, but also in the provinces, particularly in Africa, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, and Bulgaria. The, there, are, there are other similarities which show that the Catholic doctrine of Mariality is an offshoot of Babylonianism. This wor word translated into English means my lady. In Latin, would be translated mia dominia. This name becomes the name Madonna, which is the name by which Mary is often referred. The same reasoning can be applied to the name Medi Mediatrix, which Mary is also called. Since the, since the Bible teaches there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, it is obvious that Mary did not receive that title in a biblical way. She instead acquired it from Melita, Mediatrix, which was one of the names of the mother goddess of Babylon. The Queen of Heaven is another name for Mary that has been adopted from the pagan Babylonian religions. Thus, it is obvious that the Catholic doctrine of Mariality is nothing more than the ancient Babylonianism dressed up in Christian terminology. Babylonianism has been passed down through the ages in the form of symbolism also. The Babylonians were very symbolic in everything they did, and these symbols of worship can still be seen today. One of these religious symbols is the rosary. This article is not an invention of the papacy, but has been around since the earliest times and is almost universally found in pagan nations. It was used as a sacred instrument by the Mexicans, and it is repeatedly referred to in the Hindu holy books. 
In fact, images of the goddess Diana showing her show her to be wearing rosary beads. So this Catholic ritual holds its origin in pagan religions which stem from Babylon. A second symbol of importance within Babylonian religion is the obelisk or tower. The obelisks were found all throughout the areas of Babylon and Egypt. Often these obelisks have been transported to places of high esteem, such as the entry to St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome or the Washington Monument. As is above, so is below. The reflection in the, in the water, right? In Babylonian religion, these obelisks served two purposes in worship. First of all, they were associated with sun worship. They pointed to the sun in a form of homage to it as great life giver. Yet these monuments also stood as symbols of fornication. They were representative of a phallus, which along with the sun was considered to be a symbol of life. So these obelisks were really a combination of the fornication rituals and sun worship. When Israel backslid, they erected these at the entry to the temple in defiance to God. Remember the image of jealousy? That's the image of jealousy in Ezekiel 8. This makes it very interesting when it is shown that such an obelisk does sit at the entrance of St. Peter's. It is also interesting to note that the, when the obelisk was to be erected at St. Peter's, the Pope attached the death penalty to the workers should the monument be broken. Obviously, much importance must be placed on this pagan monument by the Catholics. This is another example of how Babylonian paganism has continued down until this time. Another doctrine of Babylonianism, which has been carried on till today, is that of the celibacy of the priesthood. This practice started with Queen Semiramis. This practice quickly spread throughout the pagan world. It finally arrived in Rome through the worship of the Babylonian goddess Sibyl. This practice has been continued down through the, se the years in, Catholic, in the Catholic Church. Going along with the oath of celibacy was the priestly tonsure. The tonsure is the shaving or clipping of a round spot on the head of the priest as their ordination. This practice was the carryover from the ordination of the priest of Bacchus, which is another name for the illegitimate son of Queen Semiramis. So even this mark, which priests receive as initiatory rite, has its origins in the pagan religions of Babylon. Let me see if I can finish this up quickly. All right, bear with me here. I got one more page here. I got to get through, and then we're done, because I don't have time to add this to the other one, so we're going to finish it here. All right? The clothing of the harlot identifies her. This is very short. Her clothing identifies her with Rome, arrayed in purple and scarlet color. The apostles and Christians of the early churches were humble Bible believers who lived simple lives and did not follow the pattern of the world's leaders in religions. The harlot church, on the other hand, loves impressive cathedrals, flowing robes, gorgeous ritualism. Expensive ecclesiastical clothing and trappings. Revelation 17.4 describes exactly how Rome's bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes are clothed even to this day. With the utmost pomp and magnificence in purple and scarlet, which were the colors of the imperial habit, the purple in times of peace and the scarlet in times of war. And the scarlet is the color of the popes and cardinals. As it, as it is used to be that of the Roman emperors and senators. Nay, the mules and horses which carry the popes and cardinals are covered with scarlet cloth, so that they may properly be said to ride upon a scarlet-colored beast. The woman is also decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And who can sufficiently describe the pride and grandeur and magnificence of the Church of Rome in her vestments and ornaments of all kinds? One remarkable instance of this we, we have in, in Paul II, whose mitre was set with diamonds, sapphires, emeralds, chrysalis, jaspers, and all kinds of precious stones. And another conspicuous instance is the Lady of Loretto, the riches of whose holy image and house and treasure are far beyond the reach of description. Their silver can hardly find an admission, and gold itself looks but poorly among such an incredible number of precious stones. Moreover, the woman, like other harlots who give filters and love potions to inflame their lovers, hath a golden cup in her hand like the ancient Babylon. The color scarlet, it is remarkable, is that reserved for popes and cardinals alone. Paul II made it penal for anyone but cardinals to wear hats of scarlet. Roman ceremonial, this book was compi compiled several centuries ago by Marcula Marcellus, a Roman archbishop, and dedicated to Leo X. In it are enumerated five different articles of dress of scarlet color. A vest is mentioned studded with pearls. The Pope's mitre is of gold and precious stones. These are the very characteristics outwardly which Revelation thrice assigns to the harlot or Babylon. So Jachim and Abbot from Calabria 
about A.D. 1200, when asked by Richard of England, who had summoned him to Palestine concerning Antichrist, replied that he was born long ago at Rome and is now exalting himself above all that is called God. A little dangerous, wasn't it? Roger Hoveden in the Annals and elsewhere wrote, in the Annals, excuse me, wrote the harlot arrayed in gold as the Church of Rome. Whenever and wherever, not in Rome alone, the church, instead of being clothed with the Son of Heaven, is arrayed in earthly, meretricious gods and comp compromising the truth of God through fear or flattery of the world's power, science, or wealth. She becomes the harlot seated on the beast and doomed in righteous retribution to be judged by the beast. Now listen to this. The Catholic Encyclopedia describes the garments of the Catholic clergy. One is called the Kappa Magna, Magna, the Kappa Magna, a cloak with a long train with a hooded shoulder cape. The color of it was purple wool for bishops, scarlet silk for cardinals, and red velvet for the pope. The cassock was a close-fitting ankle-length robe. The color was purple for bishops and scarlet for cardinals. And finally, her location identifies her as the great whore. Tradition holds that Romulus founded the original city on the Palatine Hill and that the seven hills were first occupied by small settlements that were not grouped nor recognized as a city called Rome. The seven hills denizens began to participate in a series of religious games which began to bond the groups. The city of Rome thus came into being as, they, as these separate settlements acted as a group, draining the marshy valleys between them and turning them into markets. Later, in the early 4th century B.C., the Servian walls were constructed to protect the seven hills. Her location identifies her. John pictures the great harlot sitting upon seven mountains, which most Protestants of old and fundamentalists of the present identify as the city of Rome. The woman is a city, and the city is Rome, the religious capital of the world. Rome was a city set on seven hills and was known as such to both pagan and Christian writers. Ovid says this, Rome looks around on the whole globe from her seven mountains, the seat of empire and abode of the gods. She is religious Rome, which at that time will have inherited all the religions of the world. It will attain the goal of the present day apostate of all the great systems of the world. Romanism, Protestantism, pagan religion, cults, and isms. The seven hills or mountains around Rome are named the Aventine, the Salian, the Capitoline, Esquiline, Palatine, Quirino, Quirino, and Viminal. Those are the seven hills of Rome. Anyway, so those are identifying marks by her spirit and by her control of kings that have committed fornication with her. That should give you an understanding of that spirit of Babylon, that one world government, one world religion, all merged into one, and also her control over all the governments so that is possible. Then you see that culminate in the end times in, that, in, in Revelation chapter 13 where the beast comes together, right, and the beast controls everything. And then you have the woman that rides the beast in Revelation chapter 17 as that continues. Next time I preach on this, we'll, Lord willing, will probably be Wednesday, we'll cover the blood of the martyrs that was found in her. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for the truth of them. Thank you, Lord, for us being able to rightly divide them and understand from the book of Revelation what's going on and see in these end times, Lord, actually see the examples over 2,000 years of that wicked whore of Rome, that wicked whore of Rome, the great whore that reigns over all the kings of the earth, the one that has the blood of the martyrs found in her, drunken with the blood of the saints. Dear God, help us to be able to teach others this, to show them, to understand ourselves, and be able to discern the times. This book is not to be a mystery to us. It's to be open and clear to us, and we're to be able to understand it, and not to be afraid of it, because we know what's coming in the end. Help us understand these great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.